So today, uh, as James mentioned, we're going to talk about some practical tips and techniques for uh, doing CACD with Puppet um, that we found to be pretty useful. Um, I was going to introduce us, but that's already been done. We're, uh, uh, Matt and I are principal engineers at Time Warner Cable on the OpenStack team. Um, we both have pretty varied backgrounds. Um, we've both done software engineering, uh, operations, IT, um, and if you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can use any of these methods. Uh, just a little bit of background on our team. Um, our team is about two years old, so we're relatively new. Um, started off really small with about uh, four people. Uh, and again, we have a pretty mixed background. We have some people that were uh, new to Time Warner Cable. We had some people that were uh, very traditional IT people, traditional developers. And so that's kind of given us an interesting mix of skill sets. Um, at the beginning, whenever we started out, uh, we really didn't have anybody that had any automation experience. Um, one of the reasons I joined the team is because they needed somebody that knew something about Puppet. Uh, and once we got OpenStack into production, we realized that the lack of process um, that we had, you know, the fact that we had no process was really hurting our ability to get things deployed. So uh, last summer, um, we started working on figuring out what our CICD process was going to be and how that would look. Uh, so this is the requisite uh, stats slide. I'm not going to read this to you, just give you an idea of um, kind of where we've, you know, how far we've come in the last year. And I think I've got some creaking going on here. <laughs> uh, uh, and a little bit of background about our Puppet environment. We're using Puppet Open Source, the 3.7 release. We haven't gotten around to upgrading 3.8. Um, we don't really use dynamic environments. Um, we have uh, uh, one environment called production. It has, uh, that directory just contains sim links back to the normal places. We don't like looking at the warnings. <laughs> uh, we don't use PuppetDB very much. We do use it. We have it installed. We use it mostly for monitoring configuration, SSH host keys, that sort of thing. Uh, we do use Hira extensively. Um, we use that to manage all of our um, environment-specific changes uh, and defaults for things. And uh, we also use the Hira YAML backend uh, for secret data. So passwords, SSL certs, anything along those lines uh, goes into the Hira YAML backend for and gets encrypted. Uh, and lastly, we use R10K for all of our module versioning and uh, um, deployment. Uh, so this is a real high-level diagram of uh, how changes start in our dev environment and how they kind of move through our CI process and end up in deployed into our staging and production environment. So we're going to cover this in a little bit more detail as we go through the talk. Uh, each of these yellow boxes here uh, represents an OpenStack region. Those usually correspond to data centers and, or parts of data centers. Um, and you'll see that we have multiple regions in our staging and production environments and then in some of our dev environments. And that slide is not working. I can't scare you with that slide if it doesn't work. OK, I, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> uh, and this is what a pair of our OpenStack regions look like. Um, reg um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about OpenStack here. This isn't an OpenStack talk. It's a puppet talk. Um, but I just want to show you here that we're not deploying really simple applications. It's not just a web server um, with a database behind it. Um, we're deploying complex applications. Um, and uh, if you do want to know more about uh, Puppet and OpenStack, uh, there's a talk tomorrow about that, so if that's an interest. Um, you can see these environments, they're relatively complex. We have multiple MySQL multi-master clusters. Um, some of those span data centers. We have multiple RabbitMQ clusters. A lot of these nodes are running a lot of different services. So the control nodes, for example, are running 20 different OpenStack services. Um, those small uh, compute and storage boxes, there's a lot more than three of those. Uh, and then there's also a lot of boxes that aren't covered here. So hardware load balancers, monitoring, those sort of things, and a lot of dependencies between these boxes that we can't really put on this slide and have you actually be able to read it. Um, so next, Matt's going to talk about um, how we deal with the complexity in this and how we represent that in our dev environment. Okay. So um, one of the questions we came to after we were already in production is how do you develop and test your changes before committing them? Um, when we were a small team and we didn't know any better, um, everyone would just SSH into the Puppet Master and just like change code and run M Collective and hope for the best. Um, that solution doesn't scale very well or at all. Um, it's also not a great idea to do that in production environment. So we needed a solution. Uh, the solution we have is called virtual dev environments. Uh, Essentially, we're spinning up OpenStack VMs to represent all the various node types that Clayton showed you before and running those in a virtual environment. And because we like playing in the hard setting, we're actually running these virtual development environments on top of our production cloud. 
Um, that gives us one major benefit is that we're heavy users of our own cloud. We can tell if something's going to go wrong um, or if something is going wrong generally pretty fast. So a bit more about these. Um, we build these with the exact same tool chain. We would build hardware, so the same exact scripting, Puppet, Ansible, et cetera. Um, every team member has their own environment. You can pick and choose what node types you want. So if you're only working on an identity server change, you spin up a Puppet Master, you spin up an identity server. You don't need to spin up that whole huge graph that, of uh, boxes Clayton showed you. You can also have more than one. You can work on more than one problem at once, like most people do. Um, if you want to, you can create a virtual router and connect your multiple environments to simulate having things in multiple data centers, um, which we use sometimes for certain services that, that do span data centers. Um, additionally, you can, it's very easy to share these environments uh, between team members. So if I have a problem with mine, I can't figure something out, I give Clayton the generated SSH key, he goes on my node, pokes around, can tell me what's wrong. So once you spun this up, you've written your code, you know it's great, it's going to work. What's the next step for us? Um, the next step for us is code review. So the, the team member commits this change locally, and then you need to submit it for review, um, which is a fairly standard process. For this, we use a tool called Garrett, uh, maybe new to some people here. It's a, uh, originally developed for the Android project. And it's now used by OpenStack and some other projects like Wikipedia. Um, all changes and all repos go through Garrett. And almost all repos have some sort of automated integration testing on them. Um, for us, we have a benefit here because the OpenStack project uses Garrett. So if you're on our team, you either already know how to use it or you need to know how to use it because you're going to be pushing code upstream. So why code review? Um, we see the same benefits that most people see, right? Code quality goes up, even a basic skimming of it. Um, in addition, there's a lot of knowledge sharing. I learned a lot of new ways to do things when I review people's code, and maybe I, they get some from me too. Um, but one thing we really didn't anticipate is the shared ownership that code review gives you. Um, if you make a change and it's reviewed by three or four people, something blows up later, it's really hard to, 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 to blame somebody. It's really a team problem at that point. Um, and one thing I alluded to before is Garrett handles all our pre-merge testing. Uh, this prevents us from merging any changes in that would break the master branch. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that whole process later. OK, so once a change is put into our internal repos, is approved and merged, what's the next step? Um, so no matter how you install your Puppet modules, um, you're going to want to have uh, reproducible results whenever you spin up a new box. Uh, and part of that is making sure that you're installing the version of the Puppet modules that you intend to. Um, and pinning to a specific tag or specific commit is something that we, I think, is generally good press practice. But how do you do that without it being really painful? So um, we have an approach that we've come up with for handling our internal modules uh, that we think is pretty straightforward. Uh, and it works with R10K or anything else that can read a Puppet file. Uh, so just a little bit of background. This is to give you an idea of what our Git repo layout for Puppet looks like. Um, we have a single top-level repo that contains all of our Hira data, our Puppet files. Um, and the master branch for that is you know, where most of the work goes on. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, Puppet File is basically just a Ruby-based file format that says, I want to install this Puppet File. This is where you get it from. This is the version that, uh, that you want. Uh, so you can see here the Puppet File uh, refers to specific Git repos, uh, each of which contains a single Puppet module. Uh, and during deploys, R10K uh, reads that Puppet File, checks out any new repos, um, you know, uh, clones any new repos, checks out the ver new versions if need be. Um, and uh, so you may notice here we have two different Puppet files. We have this Puppet file and this Puppet file at YAML, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. That's kind of the um, special part. Uh, so not spend a lot of time on this. This is what our normal Puppet file looks like. This is a snippet from ours. Um, in our case, we install everything from Git. Um, everything's locked to a specific tag or commit. Um, as I mentioned before, we don't put branch names in here because you don't know what the branch is going to point out at any given time. Um, but also, uh, R10K has optimizations in place. If you're using tag uh, or commit in your uh, Puppet file, it doesn't have to go across the network to verify that you're on the right version. It can do that entirely as a local check, which is, makes a big performance difference. Uh, so this is what uh, an entry in our Puppet file at YAML looks like. This, as I mentioned before, this is the approach we use for all of our internal modules. Um, you can see here we have a Cirrus module. Uh, if we have multiple modules, it, you'll just see multiple entries like that. 
Um, the two highlighted sections here are the only parts that are actually used. Uh, the rest is informational. So if you're in there and you're wondering what that you know, git commit hash it refers to, that gives you a little bit of information about where the, what that comes from. Um, so a little bit of background, whenever we were, um, before we were using Garrett, um, our normal process was you'd make a change in a puppet module, uh, you'd commit that, you'd create a tag, you would go ahead and push the commit and the tag, you'd go and make a change to the puppet file, you'd put that tag in there, you'd commit that, you'd push that. Um, and that was really annoying, um, but we lived with it because it's what we had. Whenever we were looking to move to Garrett, we realized that was gonna become completely miserable because uh, it would involve all these steps that we already talked about, plus you would have to wait for someone to review each of those changes. Uh, and we thought code review was gonna be a hard sell to the team to start with. We didn't think we'd be able to get people to actually buy into that. Um, so whenever we moved to Garrett, we put this approach in place. Um, so basically what happens here, here is, is that whenever uh, a change is merged in Garrett, so it's past code review, it's past all the CI processes, um, a, Jenkins process, a Jenkins job automatically kicks off, goes off, gets all the metadata about the change that was merged, updates this file automatically so that it's always pinned specifically to that commit. This is made pinning to a specific version in our, for, our, for our internal modules completely painless. It's something we don't even think about at this point. Um, another thing that we didn't really anticipate is that it also means that in our main repo, um, we end up with a matching commit for every change in all of our internal Puppet modules. Um, that means that we can look at our top level repo and we can look at the commit history for that and we can see all of the changes that have been made in a single place. Um, once we realized how useful this could be, we actually started putting some of the metadata that you see here in the commit message for that also, so that you can really go through and you can see the descriptions for those commits that have come in. So, how does this work? Um, this is what the top of our Puppet file looks like. Um, those of you that know Ruby probably have an idea of what we're doing here. The comment explains it a little bit. Um, as I mentioned before, the Puppet file is just Ruby. Um, so that means that you can extend the Puppet file with Ruby if that's something that you have a reason to do. Um, so basically what this does is that it goes and checks to see if a puppetfile.yaml file exists. Um, if it does, it reads that file, parses it, and then just reads that into the, uh, the normal Puppet file syntax. Um, so this approach doesn't require any special changes to R10K or Puppet Librarian if you're using that. Um, it doesn't require that us maintain a fork of R10K um, or try and get um, you know, that pushed upstream. Uh, additionally, since this file, uh, the public file YAML is just a YAML file, it's really easy to parse, it's really easy to update, the tools that we have for doing that are really straightforward. So uh, other tools that kind of cover the same space, um, another Time Warner Cable employee, Phil Zimmerman, gave a great talk at PubicConf last year um, about how they handle a similar problem, and he's since open sourced a tool called Reactor uh, that covers some of the same space, space as our approach. Um, his tool's focused on um, creation of new dynamic environments in, for doing development, um, and modifying the puppet file automatically, running R10K for you automatically. Um, it provides a pretty opinionated workflow, but it's one that will probably work for a lot of people that do use dynamic environments. Um, our approach was really heavily inspired by Phil's approach. We saw what he did and we were like, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a great idea, updating the puppet file automatically. That's a thing that we should do. Um, but we already had Ruby code uh, that we had inherited in our puppet file and we were like, well, I don't want to write a Ruby parser, but I, can, I, I already have YAML parsers. Um, so that's kind of how we ended up where we were. Another thing, the tool that you might want to look at is uh, camp to camp released their Puppet File Updater tool in the last couple of months. Um, this provides some rake tasks for automatically updating Puppet Files. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So as Matt talked about earlier, um, we had to do some pre-merge testing as part of our code review process. Um, and the question we're trying to answer here is like, how can we be sure that whenever we go to do a deployment that we're not going to have Puppet catalog compile failures or anything along those lines? Um, we found that like automated pre-merge testing is a great way to cut down on those sort of problems. Um, so if you're doing code review of any sort, whether or not you're using Garrett or whether or not you're using GitHub pull requests, um, you're generally gonna be waiting for a human to look at that code. Um, in that situation, we think it makes a lot of sense to uh, put as much effort as possible in providing that reviewer with as much information as you can. Um, you know, each time we have a new change put up a review, um, our pre-merged test jobs trigger automatically. Most of those test jobs are really simple. Um, puppet lint, syntax checks, unit tests, those sort of things. 
Uh, one thing we do that is a little unusual, we think, um, is Puppet catalog compiles and diffs. Um, and uh, we've really gotten a lot of mileage out of this technique, and it's something I want to tell you a little bit more about. So a little bit of background. Um, when you run Puppet, um, the Puppet Master builds a catalog of all the managed resources on it, and it pushes it down to the agent, and the agent does what it's supposed to do. Uh, the inputs to that process are your Puppet code, your higher configuration, and facts from that node. So we already have the higher configuration and the Puppet code in Git. Um, we have a Jenkins job that goes out every couple of hours and pulls all the facts from all of our Puppet Masters and checked, checks that into uh, Git. So with those three things, with those, you know, that gives us the three ingredients we need to be able to build a catalog for any of our nodes um, anytime we want from you know, anywhere, including inside of Jenkins. Um, so the way that this works for us is that every time somebody puts up a change for review, we build catalogs for uh, every node um, of each type in each environment, so dev, staging, prod. But um, we don't generate just a single catalog for that, although that would be useful. We also gen we generate a catalog of what the, it would look like before the proposed change was put in place and also after. Uh, and then we take um, the catalog diff puppet module that uh, was, uh, that's, uh, was done by Zach Smith, and um, we use that tool to diff those two catalogs and tell us exactly what the changes between those two catalogs are. Um, Jenkins then takes that output, um, posts a comment on the code review, and um, a link to the details where you can go and see more about what's actually changed. So I want to show a couple of examples uh, that kind of show off how, what this actually looks like. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we use MySQL pretty extensively. Um, we configure all of our MySQL instances using the Puppet MySQL module. So, um, you know, the question here is what happens if you accidentally delete that out of your Puppet, uh, puppet file? Um, so the short answer is, is that things fail miserably. Um, and that's great that, you know, we can see here that it failed miserably because it didn't fail whenever I was doing a deployment. I didn't find out even um, whenever I was deploying to a shared dev environment that it failed miserably. So um, this is exactly what we're trying to achieve. But um, this doesn't give us a lot of information, so if this was a less obvious thing, anybody could go look at the diff and see what was going on, uh, how would we tell what was going on? So um, this is what the catalog compile actually looks like, um, the output from that catalog compile looks like in the Jenkins job. Um, you can see here it says, could not find declared class MySQL server. This log probably looks pretty familiar to all of you that have run the agent and gotten errors back, which is probably everybody in the room. Um, if it was something um, a little bit more uh, harder to trouble, troubleshoot, you could, this is where you would start. Uh, this is an example that's a little bit more interesting. Um, whenever I was looking for some exa uh, examples for this talk, um, I realized that we had the Puppet uh, MongoDB module uh, still in our Puppet file. We don't use MongoDB anymore. Um, we stopped using the piece of software that needed that months and months ago, partially because it used MongoDB. Uh, <laughs> And so I put up a code review to remove that module out of there. Um, so I was pretty sure that this is going to be successful. This can confirmed my suspicions. Um, you can see here that it was successful. And you see here the uh, message that Jenkins posted saying, hey, look, nothing changed on any of your nodes. That's great. So this change has been merged. And now everything's a little bit cleaner than it was before. Uh, so what else is this good for? Um, Hira uh, and code cleanup is uh, the, our original use case for this. Uh, we originally used kind of an OpenStack cloud in a box sort of thing. It was super flexible. Um, it had a lot of Puppet modules in it that we had no idea what they did. We didn't understand the Hira config. Uh, and over time, we kind of figured out how that was working. But we were kind of afraid to touch it in a lot of places. Um, this has given us a really good tool to be able to go in there and say, you know what, I don't know what these three variables do. I'm going to delete them. Let's see what, what dies. Uh, and a lot of times, nothing died. And we're like, well, that's great. We can just remove that. So we've used this to remove modules. We've cleaned up thousands of lines of Hira config and Puppet code that wasn't needed or was poorly organized. Um, another thing is for what-if scenarios. This has given the um, people with the most Puppet experience on our team a really good tool for kind of figuring out um, you know, what's going to happen. But it's um, one thing we didn't anticipate is the people on the team that have little or no Puppet experience, this also gives them a really great tool because um, a, a new person on the team can uh, say, for example, they, somebody, they get the, the ticket to uh, update the DNS servers on all of our production servers. 
Um, that's kind of scary. You get that wrong, that's a big problem. Uh, they can go in and they can make that change locally. They can't actually really test it because they're in a development environment. They don't, and we don't want to make that change in prod. Uh, they put that up for code review. A couple of minutes later, they get a report back that says, these are exactly what the changes are going to look like confirms their change or doesn't. And it also gives us more confidence in what the, the change that they've proposed. Um, lastly, uh, well not lastly, but another, the last uh, example is uh, upgrading Puppet modules. Um, so we use a lot of Puppet modules. We have, I think, last count, like over 90 Puppet modules in our Puppet file. Um, we try and keep them up to date, but we don't have time to dig in and read all of that code. Um, change logs are great. Some author, module authors are really good about them, but not everybody is, and they don't always cover everything. Um, but the, they also don't tell you what's going to change in your environment. They talk about all the features in the module, some of which you may not even use. And um, what you want to know is what's actually going to change in your environment. Um, so this is the output from Jenkins after um, we updated the Puppet file to start using the latest version of uh, the Puppet NTP module. Um, we were a couple of minor revs behind. So you can see here that the catalog compiled successful. That's a good sign. Um, and you'll also see that 65 nodes are showing this changed. I had to truncate the output. Um, we don't do catalog compiles for every node. We do one for basically a representative node in every environment. So um, uh, one load balancer node in our uh, prod east environment, our prod west environment, our staging east environment, our staging west environment, that sort of thing. So whenever I did this, it was 65 nodes. I think now it's like a little bit over 70. Uh, and so at the bottom, you can see a link to details about the changes. So um, I want to show you guys what that looks like. So uh, we're going to do a quick demo. Um, hopefully this will go well. Uh, if you want to follow along, you can um, go to that link. Um, and this will be available later. Um, and you can kind of use that interactively. Um, this is going to be using the uh, Camp to Camp Catalog Diff Viewer. This is relatively new. It came out in the last couple of months. Um, we've worked with those guys and been able to help um, work out a couple of minor problems. Um, so let's see. There we go. So uh, this is what, the, what this will look like. So you can see here at the top, um, it says, or maybe you can't, the font might be too small. Um, it's, uh, there's 65 nodes with changes, and it lists all the nodes. Um, you can go and you can click on any one of these, and it gives you a summary of exactly what's changed on that node. Uh, you can go over here and you can see that there are um, no added or removed resources, and you can go down and you can see that there is one resource that's changed. And then down here in line, you can see that it's the ntp.conf. Um, so you see the checksums changed. That's expected. The files changed. Um, you can see that there's changes around the uh, restrict line. That's something that I thought probably looked okay, but had to go do a little bit more research. And then if you scroll down a little bit further, you see that there's a bunch of changes in the server lines, and that's potentially concerning. So um, after going through all of that, we see mostly that the only thing that's changed is that the iBurst line has been added. And if you know very much about NTP, iBurst is generally a good thing. Uh, so I was actually a little surprised that that wasn't there already. Um, so the next step here, and there's a lot of them, is that uh, you can go through and look at these, and if you click on them, you can see that um, all the changes are basically identical. Um, and that's not really surprising because our NTP configuration across all of our environments is the same. We use the, um, the same NTP servers. So all of these are um, the same. It looks good. We verify the change, and then we can go ahead and merge this and get it deployed and be confident of exactly what's going to happen. Uh, one other note on the, um, if you go to the project page for the catalog diff viewer, um, there's a, a demo there where you can click um, upload your own catalog diff as a JSON file, and it'll show you what it looks like without having to have this installed or anything along those lines. So. Okay. So um, we covered some of the advantages or reasons you'd want to use uh, catalog diff uh, or do catalog compiles. Um, validating your config in all your environments before you do a merge is really awesome. Um, you're not going to do a production deploy and find out that like, you can't even get a catalog back from the Puppet Master. So that's good. Um, it also provides more detail than simple syntax checks. Um, and it tests things that RSpec doesn't even try and do. Um, it's also essentially free in terms of effort once you set it up. There's no extra code to write on every change. Um, 
Uh, this is really huge with new Puppet users. If you have a hard time getting other people in your team to write RSpec, this will not solve that problem, but it will help you understand the changes that they're proposing a little bit better. Um, and another benefit here is if you're, you know, integration testing will provide you with more detail, more confidence, but integration testing takes a lot longer to run than this. In our environment, it takes us about five minutes to run a catalog compile for 65 nodes. So what doesn't it do? It does not report on Ruby code changes, and that's a pretty big gap. Um, it's not gonna tell you that custom facts, functions, types, providers changed. Um, it's, we've developed a little bit of a blind spot around that. Um, that's something we have had to unlearn. It's also not gonna tell you if services are gonna get restarted or if packages are gonna get upgraded. Puppet only knows in the catalog what you want it to be. It doesn't know what the state of the node is at the time that it does the catalog compile. The agent is what does that. Um, we're intending to address that gap um, with uh, some improvements to our integration testing and we're gonna talk about that uh, a little bit more. So you might be thinking, uh, this sounds awesome. Uh, I can stop writing RSpec tests. I can stop using Beaker. I can stop feeling bad about not writing RSpec tests. Um, not really. It's, they're complementary. Um, RSpec's really great for modules that have um, uh, a lot of complex interactions. If they support multiple operating systems or they have a lot of different options, uh, that's not the sort of thing that this is going to catch. It tests in your environment. Um, but to be honest with you, we don't write a lot of RSpec tests for our internal modules. We use it strategically. Um, we have a pretty homogeneous environment. We have a single operating system. We have a single relatively complex app. We don't have you know, 200 and you know, 300 different apps. Um, however, we do write RSpec tests for pretty much everything that we submit upstream, assuming that the projects have tests. And in fact, a good example of that is the uh, uh, Puppet OpenStack modules. Um, Matt and I are both reviewers on that project. And, uh, our spec tests are required for everything there, and for good reason, because those modules are very complicated. It's very mix or match, um, and they support multiple operating systems. It's a, it's a great use case for why you would want to use our spec. Um, lastly, we don't use Beaker. Um, we, whenever we started doing integration testing, Beaker was pretty raw, um, but we think Beaker looks like a great tool. If we were starting over again on doing integration testing, Beaker would be on the short list of things that we look at. This does not replace Beaker. Um, so, uh, Matt's up next. Okay, thanks. So Clayton's talked about the pre-merge testing, but what about pre-deployment testing? How do we know um, what this is actually going to do to our nodes? Uh, for this, we wrote um, an automated integration test, which we call our multi-node test. Basically, um, on every, every hour and on every commit, we're building our five key node types, which is a puppet master, a load balancer, an identity node, a control node, and a compute hypervisor. This basically tests, can you still build these node types with the current state of the repo? This is important to find out. We're running on commodity hardware, which will break, and if your identity node goes down at two o'clock in the morning, you want to just be able to pixie boot it and have it come back. You don't want to find out that you've broken new node builds at two o'clock in the morning. In addition, we get a little bit else for free. Um, since Puppet's building these nodes, and we have providers that interact with the APIs in these nodes. We have a basic assumption that some of the basic APIs on these nodes work. Um, this environment originally took us about an hour to build. We've gotten that down to about 35 minutes, and we're gonna go into more detail on that in the next slide. Uh, these environments are completely transient. So um, every time uh, the test runs, uh, we use a tool, called, a tool called Node Pool, which is an open stack specific pool, tool for building um, Jenkins slaves and then destroying them when done. Um, there's alternatives to this like Beaker and cloud formations and stuff that may work for you if you're not doing open stack. Uh, the most important uh, benefit of this tool is that we can catch breaking changes post commit. Um, this is not ideal. Um, but because we run this um, every commit or every batch of commits or every hour if nothing else is going on, we can generally go back and if something's broken, we can narrow it down to two or three commits and then we can go find those people and tell them to go fix it. Um, if you do a test that runs post commit and runs like this on a schedule, you have to make fixing things a priority. We let it break before, we let it break for days before and we go back and try to fix it and now there's three things broken instead of one. All right, so one of the reasons we didn't do this at the very, very beginning um, was because um, to serially build all these environments with dependencies, it, it would take like an hour and a half. 
Like I said, we have five nodes to build. Um, you can see like a dependency tree down there at the bottom. Everybody depends on the puppet master. Um, the control node depends on the identity server being up. The identity server depends on the load balancer being up. So um, it's, it's relatively serial. Building a puppet master VM all the way up to functional takes 20 minutes. Building the most complex node, which is we call a controller node, takes 30 minutes. So if you add those up and you look at this parallel chain, how, how do you do this in 35 minutes? The solution, of course, to all problems is parallelism. So how do we do parallelism? Um, the first basic thing we do is that we have our jobs run curl in a loop to test when the Puppet Master is ready. This lets, up, lets us stand up all the VMs at once, install all the base OS packages, and have the nodes ready, and just curling over and over until the Puppet Master is ready to respond. Once it re was ready to respond, we kick off Puppet on all the nodes. The next piece is more interesting, and it relates to some of the stuff discussed in the keynote today, because it's a very similar solution. Um, some of you may know that PuppetDB has a custom provider that allows you to do a retry and HTTP request every you know, X number of seconds for a length of time. So we're inspired by that, and we took that and created our own TCP and HTTP validation functions based on this code. This lets us create validation resources that essentially block the Puppet run until the resource is available. So the control node comes up, kicks off Puppet as soon as the Puppet master is ready, but as soon as the Puppet gets to a point where it needs the identity server responding, it just blocks and spins and waits. What's interesting is another Puppet OpenStack contributor named Giannis Ganon had the same idea in, as we did, and his implementation is in the in-progress Puppet health check module. Um, to note, if you're going to go look for it, the HTTP connection validator is not merged yet. But since this module came out, we've dropped our internal code. We switched to a fork of this. Um, it's in our public GitHub repo for TWC OpenStack, if you're curious. This health check has other uses as well. Um, all of OpenStack um, has providers that talk to the OpenStack services. And any time a service is restarted, it's not immediately available. So depending on how lucky you were and what the state of the service was, if you made a config change, the service restarts, the provider fails, you're halfway through a 200 node deployment and it's broken and now you don't know what state you're in. So these health checks really stopped all those sort of transient timing problems for us. Oops. Okay, let's do an example of this. Here we have an app server, and it's exposing a REST API, but because it's written in Java, it takes 45 seconds to start, which is probably, probably about right. We also have a custom provider here that provisions services, but it needs the REST API to be working to do that. So if you have code like this, you're going to have two problems. The first is your initial puppet run is guaranteed to fail. The second is if you ever change the app, restart it, upgrade it, whatever, you're probably going to fail, depending on the order in which the resources are applied in your catalog. So the solution is the HTTP connection validator. OK, good, it showed up. <laughs> um, this essentially sits between the two and ensures the puppet is essentially blocked until the resource is available. So what do we want to do to improve our integration tests? This is a, uh, something for a huge, uh, huge focus and huge potential for us. So some of the things we either have in progress or planned right now are um, we'd like to, the ability to stand up a virtual staging or virtual prod environment, uh, base it on the current tag we're on, and then upgrade it. Upgrade it to the new tag that's going to be part of our deploy. The reason we want to do this is in OpenStack, there's two things that have major impact to our customers, and those are service restarts and package upgrades. There's some OpenStack services that if you restart it, the VMs you're hosting lose network access for like five minutes. Um, customers not, tend not to like that. So if those services are restarting, we need to know and we need to plan accordingly. Um, our solution to this is to do this virtual staging or virtual prod environment and process the logs and see what services Puppet will restart. Uh, right now, someone's literally doing this by hand in our staging environment. Additionally, we, we have post-deployed validation tools. It's, it's all written, but they're all run by hand. So if we build this virtual staging or virtual prod, we do this upgrade, we see what's restarting, and then we can run our full validation test against it. We can also know if we broke anything. And to be completely honest with you guys, all this stuff was supposed to be done before this talk today. 
<laughs> Most of this is nearly done, and uh, hopefully we'll be done soon. Okay, we've hinted a little bit about deployments and continuous delivery, so let's go into that. Briefly, briefly how we do deployments before we talk about CD. Uh, we do a, a normal, should be boring deploy to staging and prod at least once a week. We deploy from a specific tag off the master branch. We go to staging first, we run the validation. If everything passes, we do the same deploy to production. So how do we actually do this? And there's gonna be a dirty word on the next slide too. Um, we, we use Ansible to orchestrate all, all the configuration management changes, but Puppet's what's doing the work. So Ansible checks out the code, uh, runs R10K, it handles things like node ordering, um, so we have certain nodes that need to be, have Puppet run on them first. It also handles um, rolling upgrades along with pre and post health checks. So what I mean is we have an identity cluster, so we run Puppet on one node in the cluster, then we run a health check on it, because if we've blown up that node, we want to stop the deploy at that point. The rest of the cluster is still okay and probably still working. Um, in addition, Jenkins actually drives Ansible. Um, Jenkins gives us a bunch of benefits, auditing, um, a shared view of logs, uh, storing of logs, and ability to go back and, and see what happened weeks and months later. Okay, what about CD? We are currently doing automated continuous deployment into our shared dev environment if the integration test passes. Why is this useful? So it used to be that it was done ad hoc. Like you made a change and the code review merged it, you would just say, well, I guess I'll go do a deploy to dev today. But maybe you forgot. So, or maybe you have a last minute change, you wanna go out in the weekly. So you jam it in last minute, you tell them the weekly's good, but it's never actually been deployed anywhere, not even to dev. This was a problem, it caused problems when we would go to staging. So we have automation that captures a list of all the changes that have been bundled up since the last deploy, post it to our uh, team chat room, along with a link to the console so you can watch the deploy, and it, when it succeeds or fails, it posts that information as well. What do we wanna do here? Like I said, we're only doing, we're only doing dev, and we have a vision for this. Um, we really want our deploys to be boring. Um, it's not fun when, they're, when exciting things happen in deploys. We have a lot of ceremony around our deploys, and one of the things we do is a weekly phone call to go over all the changes in the deploy, that's really not fun. And so we can provide some tooling here that'll really help the situation. We need tooling to help decide what tickets are part of the deploy, help generate a list of get changes that are part of the deploy, and we need more automation with our validation tool. Once we have all these pieces in place and we have more confidence in this process, we'd like to roll this out to staging and prod. The number one blocker for us to run this to staging and prod is that knowledge of things about service restarts and package upgrades, just because of the customer impact. Okay, performance tips and tricks. The first one is obvious. Parallelize everything. Um, if you can break your jobs up into multiple parts, do it. Um, look into using Jenkins matrix jobs if possible. Um, that spreads our catalog compiles off uh, across multiple slaves. Um, when we do our catalog compile, we use XARG's parallel mode to speed things up. Uh, we also contributed uh, code to the catalog diff module to use the parallel gem if possible, when possible. Also, we'd recommend use disposable one times use slaves for your CI work. Um, this lets you do things you wouldn't want to do on a node you want to reuse. Um, we use libeatmyData to disable all synchronous writes. Um, we turn off all the ext4, ext4, ext4 file system safety features. We like no a time, no barrier. We turn journaling off. Doing these two things makes our integration tests run twice as fast. Finally, this one's. Oh, I need to learn how to use slides. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Um, build a cache of your Puppet modules. If you have a CI job that needs to check out all your Puppet modules, it can be slow. So for us with 90 modules, the checkout of a raw uh, from nothing took four minutes. So now every morning we have a Jenkins job that runs, checks out the full um, Puppet module and puts them into an archive. Then when our CI job runs, we basically W get the archive to put a baseline down and run R10K on top of it. 
Um, this dropped us from four minutes to five seconds. I'm going to be careful when I scroll now. Um, finally, we do something similar with our VM or Docker images. Um, One-time use slaves are great, but when they come up, they're missing the packages you need. Um, you, for us, we need Puppet, we need Get, we need a bunch of packages to run all these jobs. So every morning, we bring a slave up, we install everything we need, we snapshot it, and then the CI job runs off the snapshot. That saves us all the time of installing all the base packages on the OS that we require. Okay, just some quick thanks. Um, these are people that We've been working with on these projects. We've sent them pull requests, and they've all been really great to work with. So recommendation from us on these guys. Um, so today, we shared our, our process of how we take code from, from nothing to a virtual dev environment, code review, pre-merge testing, post-merge testing, deployments, continuous delivery. Um, hopefully, there's been some practical information here that you guys can use when you go to do your own um, CI, CD process. And um, thanks for your time. And if there's any questions, you can get us now. We only have a few minutes, or we'll be at the party tonight. And we can see you guys there. Matt and, thank you Matt and Clay, thank you guys so much. Um, so, so we are out of time now. Um, these guys should be available around, unless we can maybe squeeze in one question in the next three minutes. Um, but a quick announcement before we do, the uh, party is going to be at the OMSI Center. Uh, if you're not from Portland, you should learn that it's pronounced OMSI. I get funny looks when I say OMSI. Um, and there's going to be shuttle buses leaving from the front of the building starting at 10 to 6. Yep. So who has the coolest question for these guys? There we go. Uh, have you guys tried uh, upgrading to Puppet 4 using these process? Good, good segue. So. Uh, we, it's funny you ask. Um, we've actually been working on doing catalog diffs with Future Parser. So we've been doing work a little bit at a time to switch to Future Parser. Uh, and we finally got to the point where all of our catalogs actually compile with Future Parser turned on. Um, the, the problem that we ran into is I was like, well, that's great. We're going to run this. There's going to be no changes in the diffs because Future Parser shouldn't change behavior. Uh, and that's not the case. Um, most of the problems are actually uh, very spurious sort of diffs. It's things like um, uh, a require uh, is now inside of a single element array instead of just being a string by itself. Um, so I've actually got a patch in progress to try and address some of those things. I don't know if it'll end up in a situation where we can actually push that uh, back to um, Zach Smith's module. Um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of where we stand on this. Uh, moving to Puppet 4 is actually uh, one of the things we're looking to do uh, is basically as soon as possible. We just have to get the future parser stuff done first. Well, and a lot of other things, but that's the prereq. <laughs> We can't even start until then. <laughs> All right. Other questions? We've got a couple minutes still. I can't All right. See. Matt Clay, thanks again, guys. Yep. Fantastic talk. Thank you. Thanks.